you keep on promoting people you are familiar with because you like that dynamic. Like you are familiar and you're okay with that dynamic of I am their boss. I tell them yeah. what to do. But at some point, you need to make that mentality switch. And this goes back to the operator's owner to I tell them what to do. Instead, it needs to be they tell me what to do or what is needed. And I am the one who enables them to do that. Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable location independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. I heard once that podcasts are better for inspiration for you to think about your business than the actual information, like than education. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And today's episode is tailored for those that believe that. Today's guest focuses on big issues that often force me to reconsider what I'm doing in my business. In fact, it was a conversation with him in an office in Barcelona last year that inspired me to start remotefirstrecruiting.com and break it out from dynamite jobs. And he had a a wonderful framework for helping me think through that decision. If you've heard me talking about the pumpkin plan and kind of a customer-centric focus on growth strategy, that also came from a conversation with today's guest. And so hopefully as you listen to the conversation, when I look at the list of things we're going to talk about today, these mistakes that agency owners, and it's just business owners, it actually applies to all businesses, the mistakes that business owners commonly make from his perspective they're pretty big issues. They're the big ones. It's not small stuff like, hey, here's a tactic that you can fully understand. It's simple. You can apply it and go for it. It's more like, have you considered this? It may point to a blind spot. And I think that's what's interesting here. There's a lot of action in what we don't know that we don't know. So hopefully uh, this episode, this conversation will jog up some things for you as it has for me. Speaking of me, I don't know if you can hear from my travel mic uh, in the background, but you're here in the great city of London. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. I've just arrived uh, via train and I was on a short vacation in Paris, but now I'm back to business. Today begins a four day DC event in London, hosted by the DC London chapter. Uh, they have incredible leadership. It's Easily the most vibrant, active community inside of the DC. Shout out to Noel, Shona, and John. John was actually on the show last week, so you've heard his voice. Yeah, there'll be over 100 of us masterminding, hanging out in the park, doing activities together, sharing lessons in a peer to peer fashion. Just a bunch of founders sort of swapping notes and getting to know each other and building relationships. And it's just a killer vibe. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, we'll definitely do an episode where I share some lessons learned from that crew. One of the things that's happening in our business, just behind the scenes, I just got off the phone with Ian, is we have more demand for events than we can operationally fulfill. You know, we've got 100 of us in London this weekend. More of us wanted to come. Over 300 of you have bought tickets for Bangkok already for our annual Bangkok event. We have a bunch of other events on the schedule. And now we've got DC Black events coming up. It's looking like a big schedule of events coming up in the next 12 months. And we need help. So that could be you, someone you know, a colleague or a friend. If you know someone who's exceptional at bringing people together, understanding that that's only partially in person, but a lot of that is grind with writing spreadsheets, building relationships. If you know someone who would be a great fit for helping us connect listeners of this podcast. I'd love to hear from them. We've recently posted uh, an event manager job over at dynamitejobs.com. You can click through on the description of this episode. We're looking forward to reviewing some amazing candidates, having just some discussions and just getting some more kick-ass events on the schedule in the next 12 months for listeners of this pod. So thank you for your referrals there. So on to today's conversation. Today's guest has joined us before. And like I said, someone who really his business approach and thinking resonates with mine quite a bit. And so I get a lot out of hearing from him. He's the founder of videohusky.com. It's a productized video editing agency that he grew, inspired in part by a Tropical MBA episode about Design Pickle, that he grew to 1 million plus in revenue in two years and quote, retired in four, in part by hiring a general manager and building strong systems. Justin currently helps 
mid six figure agency owners become seven figure passive owners without those 60 hour work weeks. We geek out about the pumpkin plan and talk about five mistakes that business owners often make. Hope this conversation jogs up something productive for you. Let's roll it. All right, Justin Tan, everybody. We've told your whole story, or not whole story, but a lot, a lot of part of the story of Video Husky on a previous episode. I'm wondering if you could just explain to the, before we jump into this topic, to the audience, you know, how you ended up as a bootstrapped agency guy of all the things you could have done in life. You're a very talented guy. How did you end up on this side of the aisle? Uh, yeah. So I think my business journey is the opposite of most people's. Uh, I started on the older school, harder side, I think, with physical products, selling football uniforms and wholesale dry fit t-shirts, which is the least digital nomad type business before kind of going backwards into service. It's like the opposite of the ladders of wealth that uh, (laughs) Nathan Berry came up with. And trust me, his way is better. Do it that way. Why uh, abandon products to go to services? Because I think this goes back to whatever you want to achieve in life and what you want to do, right? And at least like in early 20s, there was only two things I wanted to do. I wanted to travel and I wanted to do it in a way that was relatively light. It was uh, ideally like 20, 20 hours a week type of business. I come from an entrepreneurial family, so they do a lot of manufacturing, they do a lot of physical goods, and it's just there's so much weight that comes with always ordering stuff, selling stuff. And when you have to deal with those kind of cash flow cycles, when you have to deal with those kind of inventory liquidation issues, it just means that you have that kind of stress that's on you perpetually versus I mm. feel like running either a freelance business or agency. Of course, there's still like weight if you have that payroll, but it's a very different kind of burden compared to half a million dollars of debt that you have to pay off, which you know you're good for six months down the road, but it's still a lot that weighs on you. And I wanted to have a business model that was a lot more streamlined and lean and cash flow positive. I don't want to wait, have to wait three years and be super reliant on whatever the market dictated. Right now, you got to do you, you have a GM working at Video Husky? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we talked about this last time. And I'm curious what your three-year outlook looks like right now and why, why make that transition? Why not just be the big bad boss at a Video Husky, the main Husky? What are you up to? Why free your time up? So that happened around 2021, 20, I think midway through. I was working with Taylor Pearson at the time. Let me just jump in here because you might not know who Taylor is. Taylor Pearson is a friend of the show, one of our top all-time guests. He's a business coach extraordinaire and also the founder of Mutiny Fund. At the time, Justin was working with Taylor as a coach. And at the time, like as we were discussing the future of the business, I realized I just couldn't see myself doing it for the next three to five years. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But the biggest reason was that I didn't really resonate with our target market, which evolved over time as Video Husky kind of grew. And the more we grew, the more we worked with content creators who had YouTube channels, who, I mean, power to them, they were able to pump out two, three, four. Some guy did like 12 videos in a week consistently. But while that's really impressive, it's something that I don't deeply resonate with. In fact, I don't even resonate with a little bit. I'm not a video (laughs) creator. I don't know the difference between a... I can't tell what's good from what's crap. And so that dissonance, I guess, made it really hard for me to be excited to work with our customers because I can't understand the nuances of the stuff that they do and say, Dad, that what they did is they created art. And so because of that dissonance, it's hard to go to work every day and be like, this is exactly what I want to do. And I I don't know, whenever I think of that moment, I always think of your book before the exit and how you were talking about cat furniture. I was like, you know what? Maybe this is how Dan felt when he was selling cat furniture. And that's why he transitioned over to that. I don't know. Maybe I'm putting words in your mouth here, but you tell me. <laughs> that sounds reasonable. Yeah, it was, it was really tough to get jacked up about modern cat furniture. Uh, that's for sure. I think a lot of people, they might realize that by not do something about it. Yeah. And that's the thing. It is very tempting to just kind of keep on going, especially if you can build something profitable and pay yourself well and, and like still work a relatively like good job in terms of hours. On my side, this is, again kind of goes back to family stuff. My family runs manufacturing and manufacturing is the most painful business that you can run. 
especially if you are like my dad up to now, I think he's 62. So yeah, he's just turned 62. He's traveling two times a week from Hong Kong to all over Southeast Asia, to the States, to China. And I'm like, man, you know, like, I, I think I was 26 at the time, the complete opposite. I was like, I, I don't want to live that kind of life. And he's still doing it now. And it's because of the part of it is cultural. Part of it is like the way that he's chosen to live it. Him and my family have done their life, but it's just that kind of lifestyle for compounded over decades, doing something that you feel like you have to do is not something that I wanted for myself. And so I wanted something that resonated a little bit more. I know follow your passion is like out of vogue nowadays as advice. And I still don't think it's good advice, but you still want to do something that you care about, I believe. And so video content creation, while I admire it a lot, it's not something that at least at the time and maybe and even at this moment is something that I deeply resonate with. Well, something I care about is talking about business, Justin, and you're, you're on the top of that list of people I like to talk business with. One of the, we challenged you today to, I sent you over a thing. I was like, here, give me top five ways agency owners mess things up because I know you've made your fair share of mistakes and good decisions and you've talked with a lot of agency owners helping them do better. So I'm hoping you can rank order the top five mistakes they make and give us a couple stories for each point. Hopefully we can all get better, those of us running agencies, which is a lot of us. So start us off with the first one, Justin. All right. So the first one is better clients is, well, better than more clients. And the realization for me came during COVID. I think for a lot of people who ran agencies or any kind of business during that time, you must have lost. And in our case, we lost 35, 40% of revenue overnight. And the solution was reading the pumpkin plan and realizing the importance of Wait a second, of hold up a second. <laughs> <laughs> Take me to the realization that the revenue went away. So the clients mash the button, they send you an email, they give you a call. There's a pandemic, we don't give a shit about videos anymore. What, how call. did it go? Dude, it was a bunch of emails, <laughs> man. E- emails and credit cards that didn't go through and didn't work. I think uh, we live in the modern world. There's no calling for this. What happened? What was your internal thought at the time about how you were going to get through that? It's one of those things where you realize, wow, you just don't actually know what you're going to do, right? Because it's not only that you lose 35% of revenue overnight. That's one part of it. But if you have three months worth of expenses in the bank, it's like, okay, this sucks. But it's manageable. The way that I was running the business at the time There was not three months. There wasn't even 30 days. It was closer to 10 days worth of cash in the bank. And so you want to say it's one of those lessons that you can teach somebody, but you just can't teach it until you've been there yourself, I think. And you feel the emotional, oh shit, that's it. There's like, there's not much money left and that you have to do something about it. So you didn't just like go on Amazon and download the pumpkin plan at that time. (laughs) What is it about the pumpkin plan? So it starts off with, uh, with his first book. It's the most popular one, right? Profit first. And so I think most people read that. But then I read that and I liked it. All right. So Justin and I like went off the the deep end here. We went on like a a goat path talking about profit first. I just want to explain the simple formula that Mike brings up in this book, which is a really interesting thing to do. Most of us say you have your revenue figure and you subtract your expenses and that equals your profit. So the book Profit First is one simple idea, which is that you change the equation to revenue minus the profit you want to achieve equals then your expenses. And then you kind of backfill in what those expenses are. And in fact, this is what we do with our agency, by the way, I'll just say like, we understand what our profit first margin is going to be for every dollar that comes in the door. And then we engineer our expenses relative to that goal. So that's the profit first methodology. So did you manage to actually do this in Video Husky where you're doing a profit first mentality? We started with the profit first mentality and then we worked with a bookkeeper. They had a similar but slightly different way of doing things. Uh, their whole thing was your agency should have, like if you follow this perfect P&O strategy, it should have 30% net profit uh, at the mm. end of every month. And I mean, God, I would love that. But That's great. We got like, yeah. <laughs> We got more than halfway there. And so I was like, okay, you know what? This is good. 20%. It's like, I'm, I'm thrilled, you know, 15 to 20. And that worked for us. Okay. So Mike Michalowicz writes this great book, which I think is empowering to a lot of people that listen to this show. 
And he's got another book called The Pumpkin Plan. Yeah. So The Pumpkin Plan, the idea is simple. You focus on the one pumpkin on the vine and you forget all the other small pumpkins because it's the one pumpkin that will, that you can sell to make the most money, to feed your family. And that's more important than all the other little pumpkins put together. So in a business, what that means is you have one or a small subset of customers that are way more important than all the rest of your customers. What do you do with that information? Because here's like my thought is like, all right, I got a service. Call it remote first recruiting. Let's take a look at an agency. We've got 25 clients or whatever in the past quarter. I don't know. They're all buying the same service. They're all doing the same stuff. So how would I implement the pumpkin plan in that scenario? So that's my natural thought process too, right? It's like we sell flat monthly fee video editing. Yeah. Same price. How, how different can it be? <laughs> right? And as a previous customer of remote first recruiting, it's like, how different can it be? Yeah. Justin is a similar pumpkin as the next guy. Okay. So yeah. Okay. We, so we both end up at the natural place, which is like, hey, I sell the same service. Some customers might be a little bit more difficult, but more or less, it, it feels pretty smooth across the board. What did I do in that situation? So there's two ways of looking at it, and I'll focus on the easier way first, which is you think about the amount of money that people pay you, right? So your revenue. And I didn't realize this at the time, but when you, and I'm sure this applies to not only mine, but yours, as well as every other 98% of other businesses out there. It turned out that the top 20% of Video Husky's customers over, at that time, I think it was like two and a half year period, generated us 72% of revenue. But even more importantly, once you factored in the variable expenses of editing and then the overhead expenses of you know, staff, you know, random charges and stuff, the top 20% actually also generated us 247% of net profit. Wow, that's huge. So what do you do with this information then? So in this case, it goes to show that like for the same amount of work, certain customers will value you much more. In our case, even though all of our customers pay us on a flat monthly fee basis, there are certain customers who will stick around a lot longer. And as I come from a more marketing background, so my natural focus, I'm like a hammer, you know, and every problem is a nail of let's get more customers. But right. in this case, it's the wrong approach because more customers means more poor fit customers typically. But they'll come, they sign up for a couple months, they churn out. But what huh. you need to scale a profitable long-term seven-figure business is the ones who will stay with you for years. I got you. So like if, you know, it wouldn't make sense to send the same holiday mailer out or have the same customer service reps necessarily servicing all customers. You'd want to find those top 20% and invest more in that relationship, essentially, even if from the perspective of the company, everyone's important sort of thing. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's not like you invest 10% or 20% more. It's you realize they are way more important. You want to then, in our case, we put all of our best editors on our best customers. Even though I think the natural inclination is problem customer, let's put our best editor there to try and save that client. But that's how you actually screw it up because they'll leave regardless. You nailed it. But you can actually screw your best client who is the important one by giving them just an average editor. Absolutely nailed it. All right, better clients is way more important than more clients. And hey, for me, guys like me and you who love marketing, what a great message. Like remarketing to those key clients rather than continuing to try to dump more gasoline into the engine, uh, you can get it running at a lot more efficiency. Okay, so number two ways that agency owners mess things up, the Peter Principle. Yeah. So the Peter Principle, it's the idea that everybody gets promoted to their position of incompetence. Mm. It's one of my favorites of all time. If you perform well at your job, you will likely be promoted to the next level of your organization's hierarchy. You will continue to rise up the ladder until you reach the point where you can no longer perform well. And this explains why your boss is an asshole. And my <laughs> <laughs> Okay, wait a second. The Peter Principle, isn't that something that happens in corporate settings? Why is this critical in an agency? So it matters because... Sooner or later, no matter how much you grow, 
you want your best performing staff members to be able to have bigger influence. That's the idea, right? And the person who I think talks about this the most publicly is Steph Smith over at, she used to work at, what was it? She used to work at The Hustle. Yeah, The Hustle, and now works at A16T, right? And so she talks about how two or three times she got promoted to management positions, and each time she not only did worse work, but actually hated the job more than the actual content creation aspect. And that's something that I thought about a lot, both in terms of skill set and personality job fit, because the more you promote somebody, the each role requires different skill sets. And I think that's where writing scorecards for each job role is really important, because that's how you realize just because somebody is good at one role does not mean they will be good at the next role, even though that's our natural inclination. Tell me about a time that you got this right or wrong. All right, so I got this wrong, wrong once and kind of wrong twice, but that kind of worked out. <laughs> the, the first was with a marketing person. We hired a content writer who, he's a phenomenal writer. Uh, if you ever want to get great work done, he did all, he was great at interviewing. He was great at writing our case studies, great at writing uh, our autoresponder sequence. And I really enjoyed working with him. So when it came time to install a head of marketing, somebody who would be responsible for the, not only the processes of uh, marketing, but also the end results, the KPIs of how many leads do we have? How many qualified leads? How many sales calls booked, et cetera? Uh, it was natural for me to ask him. I was like, I think you should do this. Now, when I say, I think you should do this, the problem was I didn't think through what are the necessary skill sets and competencies and experience this person should have. I just said, oh, it's a guy who's kind of in charge, kind of doing some marketing stuff now at the company. Let's just stick him in there and let's see what happens. But the thing is, at the time, Video Husky relied on Facebook ads, something that he had relatively little experience with, given he was a content writer. And so that lack of job to skill set fit meant it was not only difficult for him, but it would also end up being difficult for the company because you, like month on month, you would see uh, there'd be less and less lead flow, but it was an area that he didn't have the experience to overcome some of the challenges at the time. And so, yeah, after a year of that role, it didn't work out. But it's not to say that he's not a, he's not great in his position. It's just at the time, this wasn't it. You wrote here that what I should have done in these cases was bring on someone who's been there, done that. What do you mean by that? So... The, I think the cheat code to businesses, and it's harder to do when you're a smaller business because you can't afford them. But I think once you yeah. get to seven or maybe like multi seven figure scale, you just want to bring on somebody who has been there and done that at a previous company similar to yours and just run through that playbook quicker yeah, totally. or faster. And the way that you position it to that person is in this role, you will have more autonomy to execute things the way you want to versus in the previous company, perhaps they had to, they were a number two or they had to follow certain strictures. It's interesting. Man, I have so many thoughts on that. First one, that dynamic of been there, done that, it can both be a bad thing. Like if you bring in a CEO who has like a track record of X, Y, Z, like growing through X marketing channel at a big company, they're going to just do that at your company. Like there's no way they're going to change. So leverage that fact. I did a an H1 review yesterday. I, it was like, you know, four hours long, all the talks. Oh, what's an H1 out. review? Sorry, uh, Q1, Q2. Q1, uh, Q2. Uh, so I call it first half of the year, H1. And so we're just reviewing everything. And we're going for four hours, getting horse in the mouth, talking about the nine key challenges of our company. And the number one takeaway was stop asking what and start asking who. We're at that stage now where... We just can't be running around like a bunch of Swiss army knives. We have to get people in here. We're much more effective at solving problems when we answer it with a who and not trying to be clever and figure out the what. So I totally agree with you there. The next, not always possible, but has been very powerful for us. The final thing I'll mention, there's been an innovation in a lot of tech companies that I've been noticing. We'll call it the Peter pathway. And what I'm seeing is what's happening is you have like Steph Smith as an example of a uh, an IC, an individual contributor, a beast when it comes to creating content. So it's naturally the case in a, an organization that doesn't understand the subtlety to put her, someone like her into management. 
which is like you said, a whole different skill set. So what I'm seeing is like you offer ICs their own individual growth path. Um, and you figure out like what the logical end, you know, of an IC is that's a writer or a coder or whatever. And so I think that that could be another way that people think through this. You can really drill down and say like, do you want to manage people? Do you want to manage, do you want to be a leader? Do you want to understand management principles? Or do you just want to kick ass and get a lot of people to see your shit, you know, because you can get higher level at both. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like management in of itself. That's like the difference of Michael Phelps versus Michael Phelps's coach. Who do you want to teach us? When it's like ninety nine percent of us, we don't have Michael Phelps's physical prowess, right? We need to yeah. learn how to swim with our average bodies, and so you don't want Michael Phelps teaching you. You want somebody who is good at teaching. And in the same way, you want your best ICs doing IC work. You don't want them to become a mid level manager trying to empower other people to do the same work because that's their magic sauce and making them into a manager takes that away. Hey, so you like the show, just want to remind you, we have a website, tropicalmba.com. You click through on your phone, check us out on the web, hit that subscribe button, and write the newsletter every week. There's a lot going on behind the scenes of the pod. And that's the best way to find out about upcoming events, both virtual, in-person, and much more. Check us out at tropicalmba.com and give us some feedback on this brand spanking new website. Because it's time for a spanking. All right. So number one way we screw up, better clients, way more important than more clients. Number two, Peter principle. Number three, operator to owner mentality shift. So you're suggesting here that we think too much like operators and not enough like owners or the other way around? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm suggesting. And I think especially nowadays on Twitter, there's a lot of doubling down on, oh, the solution to scaling your agency is systematizing. And I very much fall into that bucket for the longest time. But there is a danger to SOPing everything. And I'll give the book example and then an example within Video Husky. Or actually, I'll do it the other way around. Within Video Husky, because I wanted in the very beginning to make sure everything was nailed in, I went down to the level of writing canned responses for our editors. Sometimes it'd be just through how people communicated, use a few too many exclamation marks or not enough smileys here, I would go down to that level and say, you need to do this, 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 and write it in this way. Which on one hand helped sometimes because it presented the way I want it to be presented. But the problem is what happens when the way I'm presenting it is wrong? What happens if there's a better way of doing things? And Reed Hastings, the Netflix guy, he talked about this in his presentation and the book, No Rules Rules which is every time, like every time a company grows, the natural response is it's like chaos happens. To tame in the chaos, you put in processes. But the moment you have those processes, you prevent creativity. And so every time you SOP something, you're assuming that you know best. But what if there are better ways of doing things? And wow, this, that's really interesting. Yeah, and this ties back into the Peter Principle because Peter Principle, it's you keep on promoting people you are familiar with because you like that dynamic, like you are familiar and you're okay with that dynamic of I am their boss, I tell them yeah. what to do. But at some point, you need to make that mentality switch. And this goes back to the operator's owner to I tell them what to do. Instead, it needs to be they tell me what to do or what is needed. And I am the one who enables them to do that. I love that. Yeah, sometimes we can get in the trap of hiring people that emulate us too much or give us what we want versus what we need. Yeah. And I think the best example that you'll see of this, the one that most business owners understand best is bookkeeping. Because at a certain level, like when you're small, you tell your bookkeeper what needs to happen. The bookkeeper will go, okay, I'll you know figure out the books, I'll submit it, and you, that's it, you're done. You tell the bookkeeper. But at some point, you need to have a relationship where your bookkeeper or your, they become a fraction of CFO and they tell you, hey, you are overspending here, here, and here. You are under allocating here. You need to make this right. And that is a very different relationship dynamic, but one that enables you to grow your business much better. I love that. You say it's a huge barrier to overcome, this operator to owner mentality shift. Why is that? Of course, it doesn't need to be for everybody, but in a lot of cases, what do you see? I think a lot of it comes down to hero complex or hero syndrome, which 
part of it is, I guess, egotistical, right? As entrepreneurs, like you have to have some level of ego to think that you can make it, well, however small, but a still a dent in the world. But the other aspect of it is also over time, if people continually come back to you with emergencies or questions, you get used to answering that. It's like a reinforcing cycle. You just keep on going in that way. And so to get out of that bind, you have to reverse that cycle somehow. And that usually comes with hiring your first senior staff member. But the way that you work with that first senior staff member is entirely different to how you would work with somebody mid or junior level. How does it feel different? So, for example, when you think about hiring a mid or junior level, it's like one of the things that you do, you're supposed to do as a responsible business owner is onboarding. You need to make sure you're on board, you're not throwing them into chaos, right? Yeah. And so, you know, you have your day one, day seven, day 30, day 90 plan, right? We're going to have all these checkpoints, you know, like, and we're going to check them all out, which is good for uh, junior or mid-level. And to an extent, you should have that for senior level staff. But what you really want from senior level staff is you want them to be able to figure out their own onboarding process. Because the whole point of bringing somebody else on is that they're bringing a different point of view. If you onboard them the way that you see the company, then you're now stuck with your perception and you've colored that. Yeah, makes sense. Because you want somebody who is unencumbered by knowledge to come in (laughs) and say, oh, this is how you do it. I love it. All right. The fourth that you've listed here is market founder fit. I love this one because I don't hear it talked about very often. Me, you, and Taylor discussed it. I've heard Dan Norris talk about it a few times. It's not a common theme in the marketplace. How did you become aware of this and how did it manifest in your business? So I think of all the businesses that I've run, uh, this has been my own personal struggle, which is finding like a market or a group of people who I would like working with. And I think I mean, the people who nailed it best are still you and Ian. It's like location independent entrepreneur. You made it into (laughs) your guys' thing. It's like, that's just, it was genius. (laughs) But yeah, this is like, I used to sell hiking t-shirts as an e-com dropshipping store and they would message me and they'd go, hey, check this out. I was wearing your shirt and we went hiking in the Rockies. Where did you go hiking? I'm like, shit, I haven't gone hiking in like <laughs> I 14 up months. I to my condo. <laughs> yeah. And I tell you what, those, like, there were some rocks on those stairs and I almost tripped on them, but I made it there. Don't worry, guys. Uh, <laughs> and this happened again with Video Husky. So after we did the pumpkin plan exercise where we doubled down on a certain subset of customers, it turned out the subset we doubled down on were content creators. That's a bit of a challenge because I'm not a YouTuber. I'm not a content creator versus previously we had a, a good 30, 30, 30 split of content creators, small businesses and agencies. I yeah. can relate to the latter two to an extent, right? You know, if we talk about revenue, talk about it flow, deal flow, customer flow. I don't know how to talk about audience flow. I don't know how to talk about subscriber count. It's just not my thing. It's very different to what we're used to in the small business world because the content creation world, it's a much more winner takes all game. And so you have to go much further. Hopefully you get a much bigger payout at the end of it. But it's something that I personally couldn't relate to. And I could feel that every time I spoke with our customers, I didn't have the underlying level of excitement on one hand to be like, I want to help you pursue your goals because I couldn't relate to their goals. Definitely. Okay. How do we know if we're a good fit for our business? Oh, man, yes. And we're doing a lot of Taylor promo, but I think Taylor had the best. Uh, <laughs> he had such great articles. If you haven't read Taylor's stuff, you need to go to taylorpearson.com. I don't talk me. But he had this thing where it was very simple. It was like, could you see yourself having lunch with your ideal customer every Friday? And in my case, I, I love eating lunch alone. I'd much rather do that than anything. But I remember reading that thing and Wow, that's such an easy way of doing things. It's like, would I want to eat lunch with a person who I want to like, help and partner up with? I just and, cycled through the top three richest people I know and none of them want to do it. <laughs> it's rough, man. You might have to go a little further down the list. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think a lot of people, you know, I think you can focus on your end user, but you can also focus on the systems required to reach them. So whether that's a system of distributors or retail stores or... Uh, websites or software. So there's a, a lot of ways you could approach this. You, know, you could love the industry. You could love 
the tool set. You can love the systems. You can love the people in your business. You could find fit in other ways besides end user, I believe. Yeah, you could. But at least on a personal, I found if you can resonate with the people who, I hate the term serving, but you know, the people who you're working with to an extent. And this yeah. also happened for me, by the way, with my own video editors. It's like there was also a certain lack of fit there because I also don't edit videos versus... Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, by the way, I wasn't yeah. thinking of anybody who has an agency, so I got off topic yeah. in my own head. <laughs> Fair um, enough. And that makes a lot of sense because you're, yeah. typically most agencies are bringing customers on a journey. And yeah. it's high touch, it's emotional, and it's tough if you're out of the loop totally on that stuff. And so the people you work with, whether customers or staff, the more you can resonate with them, I think the higher likelihood you can work on something for 5, 10, 15, 25 years. And like, that's how great things are done. They're not done in five, 10 months, which is like, I don't know, previously, I always thought in like a three month quarter time frame. But, you know, if you want to do something really cool, it's going to take you a long, long time. You better do it with people who you really enjoy hanging out. I agree. Okay. So market founder fit number four and number five, read it for me. <laughs> yeah, the, as I told you, the not great as short notes, a long notes has to be the thing. Uh, <laughs> Opportunity vehicle bracket to skill slash work ratio bracket slash no desired end game. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll, f- we'll figure out the better way of phrasing that eventually. Okay. We'll come up with a clever Taylor Pearson esque branding of your point. What do you mean? So I think the go to example that most people in our world will, will take is Alex Hormozzi's thing. He did a mastermind, I think, with Russell Brunson. And Russell Brunson told him, was like, hey, you are a level seven, eight, ten, call it level 10 entrepreneur with a level two opportunity. And so it doesn't matter how good of an entrepreneur you are. Like if your opportunity is small, you, that is your limiting factor. I see. And, I see. So, so you have to, we've been talking about how to play well, but you also got to play on the right field kind of idea. You have to be in the right game. Yeah. And I'll say, for example, let's revert this. I think I think I'm a better entrepreneur now in 2023 than I was back in 2018 when I started Video Husky. But the opportunity for Video Husky at that time was was so good that it didn't matter that I was a level two entrepreneur because the opportunity was level called level six. So it still worked out. And even if I'm a level five entrepreneur now, if like starting a video editing agency today is like it's now a level two opportunity, you are now limited. That is the limiting factor. That's really interesting. How do you think about that? Why do you think video editing is a lower opportunity now? Just because it's still a low barrier to entry business. And so when everything can be done online, it's like the democratization of access to business means that on one hand, everybody gets more opportunity, but that amount of opportunity has to be spread up by to more people. And so even if it is a growing market, that growing market will never outpace the amount of people flooding in to try to take a part of that opportunity. Makes sense. Yeah. And so knowing that, at least on a personal level, the it just goes to show it's like it's not only about how what you can do, what matters is what is around you. And the example that reminds me of this the most, do you know Liam Martin? He's a founder of Time Doctor. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I do know Liam. I've never met him or I never hung out with him, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm familiar with his content. Yeah. So he was a customer. I think he still was a customer. Uh, Him and his partner were both customers. We talked one time and it just just blew my mind. He was like, listen, my wife has an 80,000 subscriber YouTube channel. I have a 5,000 subscriber YouTube channel. But just remember, I'm the one, like I have these multiple seven figure ARR SaaS business. And she has the smaller e-com store. And so even if the leading signal, the leading indicator of subscriber account, you think that Marielle's channel, business, whatever, is much, much bigger because her service area is much bigger in terms of visibility and stuff. It's Liam's business that is the one that is probably worth eight figures at this point, multiple eight figures. And so it just goes to show that finding the right opportunities, finding the right market matters as much as the work that you put in. Because both of these guys, they are work heroes. I don't know, they, they submit videos two, three times a week. They're all, they're great videos. 
So they both put in the same amount of work, but one person has a much bigger outcome on a financial basis, at least. Got it. So, Gates so game selection is critical, essentially, like choosing the right market. Yeah, maybe that's the title. Game selection. That's what game selection. Yeah, you can be playing this. You can be doing the same exact activities for a different market. It can be worth a shit ton more. And you know that you could take a lot of our. I mean, me finding say GMs for small agencies at five thousand dollars a pop. I could reposition the same methodology and process to larger companies and charge twenty five thousand dollars a pop. So that's just an example of that, but. You know, some games are hard to get into. That's a hard game to get into. There's a reason why we focus on on founders. Well, cool. Better clients, the Peter Principle, operator to owner, market founder fit, and game selection. When you work with founders to help them, you know, make this process from owner to operator, what seems to be the sticking points, the hardest parts for them? I think it's our tendency to rush and... It's the idea that, you know, I think most entrepreneurs have an end goal they want to get to, you know, myself included, uh, when I was running Video Husky. And there's that natural tendency to think, I just want to get there. And when I get there, equals success and equals happiness. And so you sacrifice today to try to get there faster. But there's no real getting there faster. The process has to take its time. Even if you want to hire a GM, it's like, it's going to take you four, six, 10 months, whatever it takes, you can't rush that process. And I think you see this a lot in like, it's like you can't rush planting a tree. It will take that certain time. And so the only real choice you have isn't to try to rush the process, which is what most of us do, but is to try to enjoy the journey along the way. And so that's why I try to talk to a lot of people I work with. It's like, it's going to take you that long. So don't, sacrifice today don't make yourself unhappy today wanting that end result to happen because like there's no changing that but what you can change is how you enjoy today and to not sacrifice it for that desired end goal because that's fleeting anyway so i like that you know the other thought i want to get around what you're saying right you're saying it to me i'm like oh gosh i don't want to wait i don't want to be patient so there's part of me that's like uh well maybe you could do things that there's a velocity element to it that you could speed up. I think that's kind of interesting where it's like the Jay Abraham stuff where like, can you make them purchase faster? Like in every system, there are natural tempos. If you're in a certain marketplace, people are only going to need your service so much, right? And you might not be able to speed that up, but you might be able to speed up some other element of it. And I always think that that's fascinating. Like, yeah, can I quicken the cadence? Yeah, um, and th- but that's the thing. It's like, there are a lot of things that, some things you can do. You can output more content, for example. You can up it from, let's say you're running a YouTube channel. Sure, you can go from one video to three videos to five to seven to 10, you know, if you're really, really fast. But that's not going to increase the speed at which your target market consumes your content because it yeah. just takes that amount of time. And I, I did this at the beginning of the year. I was like, you know what? I'm going to double down. I'm going to write 30 Twitter threads in 30 days. I did it. Uh, the original goal was 90 and then I was like, this is not possible. <laughs> but it doesn't speed up the process by which other people see it, read it, digest it. Yeah. And now, like, I did it in 30 days and then I didn't tweet for like, what was it, like three months? Maybe yeah. it would have been better to just be slower but more steady to enable that natural snowballing process to happen so people would know I'm more present. I love that. It's only a couple quarters ago. We were in one of these strategy meetings and you came by our office and we, I was a recipient of some Justin Tan, $500 an hour coaching. And it was sweet. One of the things that you advised us to do, you know, we had this bifurcated ICP, ideal client profile. We had like these kinds of dream clients that hire 50 people a year through our agency, recruiting agency. But then we had founders who were really our primary audience that our service wasn't really framed towards them. And so, you know, one of the things that you suggested that like, look, you know, if you want to focus on founders, you have this like longer sales process where you have to educate them as to why to use your service and stuff. And so it wasn't just a few months later that we started a program called DC Scale, which helps people scale up their business and learn how to hire higher level people in the business and everything. So thanks for that. Um, Curious where you think I should take it from here, man. So I think the best thing you guys did was splitting out 
remote first recruiting from Dynamite Jobs, just because those are two very, the use cases are very different. Dynamite Jobs is very much for you know, recruiting more. Remote first recruiting is for recruiting specific, right? And by spelling that out, I think it's not only easier for you guys, hopefully as a business, as two independent businesses to run, hopefully they're independent, but it's also they easier are. for me as a perspective, somebody who would use that to say, okay, one is for this purpose, one is for the other. Uh, and I understand each value prop much better. And so in that same way, let's say you approach the million dollar run rate. I read this somewhere and I forgot where, and I think it does apply a lot. It's like you can do one traffic channel and one product and that can get you to a million. But once you get to roughly a million mark, it's like you need to have either a second traffic channel to the same product or you need to have a second product and the same traffic channel. Of the two, the second option is by far the easier to do since that's much more within your control. And so even for example, if we were to go through the pumpkin plan exercise, I might be going back and saying, okay, what specific jobs do you guys recruit for? What types of uh, roles, what types of pay? And if you can even do it on say a pay scale and say under a certain amount uh, for this one particular role, let's call it high ticket closers. Um, something seems to be in demand nowadays then you should have to pay this amount. But if you need something that's even more senior, say a GM who, you know, like is a high impact role, you can charge a much bigger portion of that. And because you can charge a much bigger portion of that, now you can go, instead of just recruiting, you can go headhunting. And if you can go headhunting to find that perfect fit for whatever business, then that may be an extra $10,000 that you charge the client. But if you find the right person, that could be a half a million dollar lift in that business revenue or maybe even profit. And so you can do that charge. So I think this goes back to finding your best clients, seeing what roles they need to hire for, and then optimizing around that. So back to the pumpkin plan. I love it. Okay. You took it full circle. And I think you've really described our business and a lot of businesses out there well, which is a combination of relationships, podcast ads here at the TNBA occasionally, as well as going to events and stuff like that. We just kind of got to this homeostasis of that kind of seven figure run rate. And it really does feel like there needs to be this whole new product focused on our big pumpkins or that we're going to need to run a channel experiment to find a new place to branch out to, whether it's different podcasts, whether it's, whether it's a salesperson or, you know, whatever, pick up the old traction book, the one or the one of the two traction books, the one about marketing <laughs> and uh, try to find a new channel. It seems to me like the one that I would bet on is going with our best clients. Yeah, and it's just much easier ultimately to sell to your, the clients who have already bought from you, who know, like, and trust you. And that's a much easier sell than trying to find somebody new. And that's the I think, biggest lesson I've learned with Video Husky. Always work with your existing ones. And ideally, those clients you love hanging out with and you love helping and serving and bringing them to where they want to go. Well, cheers, Justin. I'm glad everybody knows like the story behind RemoteFirstRecruiting.com. It's Justin Tan's name all over it. So I appreciate your encouragement and signing off on that. Now, I think one of the reasons it's, it's really useful to have a coach or a consultant involved in your business is, you know, we were debating internally for a long time. So we were asking for external voices that understood what we were trying to accomplish to weigh in. And so having your perspective was useful to us to bring to the team and say, well, here's what Justin thinks. Here's what we think, you know, how do we weigh these things? What's the right way forward? And ultimately, a new brand appeared. And uh, we appreciate that. Thank you. Cheers, man. Glad, glad it was helpful. All right. We'll talk next time. Thanks. Big shout out to Justin Tam for coming by the show. I hope you guys loved this one too got any other concepts like this i'm interested in this sort of these kind of ideas that might jog up a blind spot or a new way of thinking about things my email is dan at tropical mba.com i gotta unpack <laughs> so, <laughs> i gotta i just arrived i literally just got off the train i'm ready for this amazing event yeah we'll be back next week hopefully with maybe a couple london stories and uh, another amazing guest thanks for joining us we'll see you next thursday 
Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.